Hi, I'm Kent Thompson. I'm delighted to be here this morning with the creative team, or at least a significant portion of the creative team of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I want them to introduce themselves and tell us what they, they're doing on the production. I'm Michael Ganeo. I'm the scenic designer for the show. I'm Scott Wentworth, and I'm the director. And Christina Padubia, uh, costume designer. Great. Um, so I have I want this to be kind of a discussion, particularly between the three of you. <laughs> but I'd ask you first, um, just to, as a question, how many times have each of you either worked on Romeo and Juliet or uh, been in it or whatever in, in your careers? So I'm just curious. I think this is the fifth time I've encountered the play, but it's the first time I've directed it. I've played Tybalt. Mercutio, oh, look Tybalt, Mercutio twice, Romeo once, Capulet, oh, it's my sixth, Capulet once. Now I'm directing it, and next season I'll be playing Capulet again at Stratford. So That's great. Seven. It's so, <laughs> coming up on seven. Michael. This, for me, this is just my second production, and, and uh, my first was just one year ago. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, uh, at least I remembered the script, so <laughs> yes. I had a leg up. Christina? Um... I've done it once before, and only two years ago. Oh, really? That's fascinating. What do you think is, uh, and how did you guys start out developing the concept that you have, which, uh, and how would you describe it? That's really what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, boy, how, I, how would we describe this? I ended up trying to shorthand describe it to somebody as the rough theater of Peter Brook meets the minimalism and elegance of Kabuki theater. Um, that, that was my shorthand. That was my <laughs> right. shorthand. And um, uh, it, the, the, the start out has been very roundabout because the very first scenic thoughts we had were very realistic from right. a city gate in Verona. Stone, Renaissance carving, and the whole nine yards. So we made this gigantic, not full circle, but I would say half right. circle. So, uh, when you were exploring that, I mean, I would say the set, it, it, is, it is minimalistic, it's very beautiful, it's obviously a, well, I don't know, to me it's obviously like a stage, platform, uh, church, temple space. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's for that, the... That's exciting, that, that, that's how you describe it, because right. we, we felt like from the get-go there was, the story is kind of lives on two levels. One, kind of a naturalistic, normal level, and then on more of a... Uh, a, a much heightened uh, mythical level and, and I, I think for me out of that myth comes that sense of ritual, temple, altar and formal presentation right? which I think exists in the production there are moments that are yes. hugely naturalistic and then the others which are very formalized and beautifully ritualistic very right. quiet very different kind of sense of time I've, I've always thought that, that, that Shakespeare plays responded very well to the sense that you don't create a setting for them so much as you build a theater for them to exist in. And um, there's so many theater references in the play. Shakespeare was obviously constantly reminding his audience that they were in a play, not in a Brechtian way to make people sit back and go, oh, I better get into my head and out of my heart, but a way of re-engaging the heart, of reminding us where we are and that we're all there together. When Juliet says, my dismal scene I needs must play alone. It's, it's not a distancing moment, it, 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 it concentrates our, our empathy with her and reminds us that we're on the journey with the characters. So, so the nature that when you walk in and, and you look at Michael's space, two guards could walk out and say, who's there? And Hamlet could start. Or right. a king could walk out and right. say, attend the Lords of France and Burgundy and the end. Lear could start, or, or, or Twelfth Night could start. I love that sense of what's gonna happen out there, you, you look at the space, you sense that there are rules to it or, or a kind of order to it in the same way that if, if you didn't know the game of basketball and you looked at a basketball court, you could infer a right. certain movement. And I think that's really exciting for an audience because I, I think it, 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 it helps to, to engage their imagination. And that's, that's the great thing about all Shakespeare plays is, is the worlds literally get created by the audience's imagination and the actor's uh, uh, language that Shakespeare has given the, the actors, everyone in the room creates 
the, 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 the space, and, and the space constantly changes because the language constantly allows it to, to, to shift. So I think it's a very exciting uh, way of, of, of exploring these plays. So Christina, how did you come up with the concept for the clothes or your designs for the clothes? Well, I came into the project um, after Scott and Michael were already a certain way along right. in, in the concept. Mm -hmm. and, and Scott sort of presented it as a choice he had already made that the, the set, which I only saw after yep. some weeks of your work, um, was going to be very abstract and, and that he was very keen on the close looking excruciatingly period which <laughs> makes me very happy yes. um, I, I mean I generally love the look of, of naturalistic realistic clothing against a really abstract background I, I, I just I love that look um, and I also think it's interesting that um, I don't know it's just my sense that Shakespeare is being presented that way um, I, I, I've done a fair bit of Shakespeare. I've been lucky enough to be involved yes. in, in a fair bit of Shakespeare over the years. And uh, I'm kind of glad to see the transpositions of Shakespeare into odd periods kind yeah. of disappear. I think, yes. I think there's a return to, to doing Shakespeare either in period, which I think is great, or modern, which I think is also great. But I don't know, something about choosing to do Shakespeare in... 1810, I'm no right. longer terribly interested in. Well, it's also, I think it's also confusing. I mean, it seems like the two, uh, the two challenges of doing Shakespeare today are the two uh, red herrings or the two <laughs> missteps that people often make is either what I call the world of eclecticism, yes. which is like, okay, we're going to be modern and we're going to be Renaissance and we're going to be 1920s. But I, I mean, we have done a bit of that. Yeah. Um, and it, yes. it, it occurred for various reasons. Um, and, and, and I think in the end we made that choice because it was the, the best way to arrive at where we needed to be mm. for, for a number yes, of but considerations. I, yes. But it, it actually felt kind of... Um, brave of me because I don't <laughs> usually do stuff like that. Right. So, so we have mixed in some, some, some kind of starkly simple costumes and, and Scott has, has used, he's managed to adapt maybe other choices he might have made to make that work. And, and so we've our, helped, our little we've of helped widows, each other with that choice, yes, I think. Yes, yes. I love the, the fact that you know, from the 19th century on when, when you know, at least Western European history kind of got invented and that, that, that sense that we were in a linear movement from one world to the next. You know, we tended to, you know, you think of, of, of Romeo and Juliet, you think of Renaissance Italy, you think of Julius Caesar, and you think of ancient Rome, and we have a sense of what those worlds were like. And what I love about the, the work that Christina has done with, with, the, with the clothes in this is that we very much put them in Shakespeare's world. It, 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 it really right. feels like that that creation of the modern world between the, the sort of Merry England Catholic past and a kind of modern beginning of the Protestant movement and, and moving into the, to the modern age. So, so, the, so often in, 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 in Shakespeare productions, actors are forced to put certain things in quotation marks, like if they talk about a doublet and they happen to be wearing a, a smart suit jacket, it, it, it feels a little quoted. Or if someone has a gun and they call it a sword. You, you constantly feel these quotation marks around parts of the play and, and the realistic world of, of Romeo and Juliet that, that, that counters the mythical world Michael was talking about. In many ways, although it's, it's, it's so famous for its, its lyricism and, and you know there are sonnets in it, various verse forms, there's rhyme, but there's also all of this prose where they talk about what they're wearing. They talk about French slops and hose and doublets and, and to actually have people wearing those things, to actually have it in front, it, it takes the quotation marks away and it allows the, the two worlds of the play to really collide and, and create energy. And that's, that's what I appreciate about it. You know, the, Charlie was, was playing Romeo, was buttoning his, uh, his doublet as he came onto the stage last night. I'm like, oh great, look, see, the, they work, they're buttons. Right. That's, how they, that's how they got dressed, you know. And you see how things get tied on and you, 
you know, it adds a kind of realism to the world. They don't look like costumes, they look like clothes. And, right. and because of that... And also, I think, you know, we talked about it, because I, I said to you when we talked about the play, I said, on some sense, I feel like we want to do a Renaissance production. Yeah. Because we've, in fact, in the last few years done either, let's pick the period, let's mm -hmm. do Taming of the Shrew in 1950s. Right. But, but this play in particular, the structure, the logic, the way they view the universe, uh, the relationships between the men and the women, and and especially in some way Romeo, because he's he's not exactly like today a typical young man. He's very lyrical. He's very romantic. He's very. It's a very heightened kind of sense. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's and in some ways Juliet is is more what we think of as the strong modern woman. It's but, true. But it's like to make those things work, I think it's really hard in a contemporary period or a really updated period because it's not the expectation that we have with that style of clothing. Yes, and certain, uh, you said it in, 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 in modern times or, or, or close to modern times, suddenly the young people have more options and so the audience starts thinking, well, why didn't she run away from home and go to Mantua? Why, why does Romeo care if he gets exiled yeah. or not? He can take her with him. They're what about married. telegrams? What about, the yeah, yeah, don't they have cell phones? What's yeah. the matter with these people? You know, because, because although obviously at the center of this story is, is this, this famous love story and, and it's very much about the, the, the journey of, of, of these two young people and what happens to them, it's, it's equally very much a, a, a play about a society, about a culture that's, that's in a collision course with itself. It's in, it, it, it's in an untenable situation and, and the feud is between the two families is just one manifestation of this corrupt society that doesn't really allow these their children to have a life to have a future so it's although it's obviously the tragedy of two people it's it's the tragedy of a larger community uh, when the prince says at the end all are punished that's true and 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 I think in order for that story to be available to uh, to an audience that the creation of, of, of that society is, is, is very important and the, the, the strictures of, of church, of, of economy, uh, much like our own society, they, they factor into how people relate to each other. Why do you think this story has become so profoundly evocative for everybody? What, it, what is it about the, that draws people to this production to, in, a, in a telling of this story again? Because we, it's been told so many ways, ballet, opera, yeah. movies, a stage, but it feels like we created something, you, you have created something special here, because in a way you're returning to some of the roots of the way Shakespeare's done. But why do you think, number one, Romeo and Juliet still endures so much and secondly, what do you think you're, is going to draw people to this production? Hard questions, but... I think, I'll start off, I think, I mean, obviously, as you say, this, this is a play that has entered the consciousness of, of our culture in a way that, that very few plays, and certainly no other plays of Shakespeare have. I, I, you know, I think if you stop someone on the street and said, you know... You, if I say Hamlet, what do you think of? They might go, oh, uh, Shakespeare play, a uh, guy looking at a skull. But if you say Romeo and Juliet, they, they kind of know the whole story. It's, 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 it's referenced in, in pop songs. It's, it's, it's all over the place. It's so available to us. Uh, and into cigar after it in Cuba. I mean, it's, it's so in our, in, our, in our culture. And I kept thinking, you know, what is it about the play? Um, and, and, and something you said a, a moment ago, Kent, was... was, was sort of my observation of, of the enduring power of the play, and I think it has to do with the creation of Juliet. I think this character is a miracle of, of writing, of, of, of imagination. The fact that it was written for an adolescent boy to play is even more miraculous that Shakespeare created this, this young woman, who is really the hope of that culture. Uh, she is the the future. She is the miracle, and and 
the feminism, for lack of, 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 a, of a better word, of Shakespeare's genius to imbue a 14-year-old girl with, with the heroic qualities that in other plays we associate with, with men is just extraordinary. You know, her influence on, on, on Romeo of, of pulling him out of uh, a potential darkness and madness and, and, and learned ridiculous behavior is, is, the, is the, the energy of, 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 of the play. You know, without, without Juliet, there's no hope for that for that culture. Um, I, so I think it's her. I think it's, it's, it's the mystery of, of Juliet that keeps us going back to that, that story, hoping that maybe one time she will actually be able to, to save the world. Christina or Michael, do you want to add anything about your attraction or not to <laughs> Romeo and Juliet? Well, uh, last night we had a, an invited audience, which was fantastic. It was, felt very multi-generational. And um, uh, we, we are really blessed with a really good cast for this production. Thank you. But um, as the play got started, um, I mean, it did. I watched this audience get, become engaged by the story. And it struck me that uh, I, I would swear we have all lived through that summer of our own being Romeo or our own being Juliet, if not once maybe several times. And that, the story, re, I think, brings us back to those emotions which are seminal in the human being. Um, and you can go from there. You know, I kind of watched mothers watch Jean Paulson play the nurse and watch her have to grapple with letting go of her charge. There, there are these fantastic characters throughout the play that if, if played by fantastic actors, are, remind us of moments in our lives which, which um, are very moving, very moving, very poignant and about growing up. And if the, if the production truly is successful, we hope, like in, in any ancient Greek audience watching a tragedy, that the hero and heroine will succeed finally. But we know they don't. And thus we are moved at the end once again, even though we know how the story ends. We are moved to see them, you know, with the struggle again, and, and I think that is why um, we we attempt the play uh, as often as we do, and I do say attempt. Well, yes, I mean we we always try to you know excavate the play. It's it is though one of those plays because of the strength of the writing and the story, and throughout our lives we see it so differently. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. remarkable yeah. because we keep coming back to it and learning something new. Yeah. And it's a very rich story it is. That, that if you ask the person on the street, they have an immediate take on it. But there are surprises for the audience when they actually revisit the story well told. There are plot points, there are, there are characters that they, they, they have long forgotten that, that are as interesting as the people they think they know and, and love so well. Christina, anything you want to add? I, I totally agree with Mike. <laughs> no, I, I mean, really, I, 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 it was wonderful to, um, to feel people all around me listening and, and understanding the language and, and well, totally understanding the language. And um, I think it's great when, when people realize Shakespeare isn't, there's no barrier. If you open your ears, it's, it's, there, it's easily understood and, and enjoyed and meaningful well you all have to go back to rehearsal so thank you so much uh, thanks for the conversation thank you thank this you. was great thanks for having us